on the hop on our ear. Oh, hello, everybody. I am here today to tell you all about gas. Oh, not many of you here, is there? Hmm? Here. Oh. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes, of course. <laughs> Silly. Uh, now, uh, wait a minute. Uh, where was I? Ah, yes. Now, gas is everywhere. There is one sort all around you above the ground. We call that air. But the one I want to talk about is underneath you. How did it get underneath you, I can hear you saying? Yes. Well, a good question that I am here to answer for you. A long time ago, let's say round about uh, 600 million years ago, oh, uh, there wasn't anything that looked like today's world. No birds and flowers and things, you know, and of course, no people, no. In fact, the only life was in the seas. And very primitive it was. Around 500 million years ago, there were small sea creatures swimming around. Now, about 400 million years ago, bigger ones arrived, and air-breathing animals. It, oh, good gracious. Hi. Oh. And, yeah, what is it? On land, the first early follies. Oh, oh, about 300 million years ago, insects had arrived. Yeah. And ooh, reptiles had started to appear. This was the Carboniferous period, a very good period for swamp forests. These great fern-like trees grew thick and fast, and when they died, they sank into the swamps to become coal. How, you might say. Hmm. A good question to which I am coming. Now you see, the winds blew and covered the swamps with sand. Yes, then the sea came. Then the sun dried up the sea. And left lots of salt and so forth. This cycle continued for millions of years. Yes, <laughs> my word, <laughs> I nearly forgot. Uh, about 200 million was a very good year for dinosaurs. <coughs> oh, and their friends. The dinosaurs appeared <laughs> and disappeared in this period. <laughs> then, of course, about 100 million years ago, flowering plants came along. <laughs> oh, beautiful. <laughs> They stayed with us for a long time. 50 million years ago, they were growing even better. During all this time, rock faults and landslips occurred. Oh, away it goes. The seas undermined the rock faces. Nobody worried because <laughs> nobody was there. It wasn't until about one million years ago that man came along and even he wasn't quite, uh, <laughs> homo sapiens. <laughs> All those forests and such like had been pushed a long way underground, deeper and deeper down. Here they are. Compressed by all that weight, they have become coal. Now, the sandy beds of the sea also got pressed down and turned into rock. I'd like you to look closely at this sandstone rock. It isn't solid like some other rocks. It's made up of millions and millions of tiny grains. Now, this is very important. Where the sandstone was on top of the coal, something special happened. The coal, buried so far below the surface, got very hot and gave off gas. 
the gas rose from the coal and filled the gaps in the sandstone. Now, this gas kept rising until something stopped it. Uh, what could stop it, I hear you saying? Yes, well, I'm glad you asked that question. A layer of salt, among other things, stopped it. The salt was in the sea, which was above the sand. Remember? Simple, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, of course. Now, salt is made of crystals that pack closely together. And this trapped the gas in the sandstone. Though, of course, where there were cracks and breaks, it got away. It got away, you see. But where the sandstone was like an underground hill, the gas rose and remains to this very day, trapped at the top. So, where you find coal with sandstone and salt over it, you just might be lucky and find natural gas. That's natural, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Why do people want to find gas, you ask? Another good question, yes. They want it because, um, uh, because uh, they want it for fuel. It is a ready source of energy and only waiting for people like us to collect it. But how do they collect it? That's a very good, uh, yes, uh, yes, obviously they get it by drilling for it. Now, one place that looked promising was under the North Sea. First of all, they did what is called a seismic survey. By sending down sound waves and listening to their echo, you can find a likely place to try, you see. The results of these surveys showed the best areas between Britain and Holland. Each country was entitled to some of this, so they divided it up fairly. Then all the different companies who wanted to look for gas got ready with their drilling rigs and went to look for gas in their own little blocks of about a hundred square miles. Well, it's not all that easy working night and day looking for gas. find it. Oh, my word. Everyone is happy. What do they do with the gas they find, you're thinking, no doubt? Uh, excuse me for a moment. Uh, oh, thing, oh, God, mix up. Uh, yes, well now that is a very simple question. They fix permanent drilling platforms. Then they drill in from different angles to drain the gas at an equal rate from all parts. Then they pipe it ashore. Of course, you can't see the pipes because they're under the sea. When it reaches land, you still can't see it because it travels under the ground. It goes all over the country and nobody knows it is there. <laughs> Except you and me, and of course a few million other people who use it every day for cooking, and heating, and industry. Now that you know where the gas comes from, what it's made of, how it gets here, and who uses it, you might well say to yourself, is this the end of the film? Oh, yes it is. Oh, I'm sorry you asked that question.